Thank you, Tristan. That's wonderful. Perhaps I could um, start the discussion by asking you about politicians, because obviously you're very um, sympathetic towards historians. I imagine you read a lot of history books. Um, how many of your parliamentary colleagues read history books and are historically minded or have a historical sensibility when they think about public policy challenges? I think I think it I think it goes in two ways. That on the one hand there are you know very good sort of you know like history and policy think tank website where you know you, th there are and, and there's a the, you know, there's the sort of recent history. So for example, one of the things in the budget is a a, a, a new scheme for uh, low income communities to save, which is which is a scheme that literally is exactly the same as 20 years ago. Um, and so there's a sort of you know recent history element of public policy, um, and that is in in the the I mean there are individuals around like Frank Field or Bill Cash or people who have an understanding of as it were the last 40 50 years of public policy making who can reach to that as as people sympathetic to history what do they read well they read what you know, white men in their 50s read, uh, which is political biographies and war. Um, <laughs> and um, um, and um, so... The, the but Linda Colley and Linda Colley. But, well, Gordon, or Gordon did, but the, the, and, and sort of disseminated it. Um, so uh, the, the, they are certainly more historically attuned um, than, than, as it were, other disciplines, and the scientists always complain they never understand about science. Um, but the, the sort of the depth and reach of that is, is not particularly uh, powerful. Let's take some questions. Um, you mentioned the, the role that historians have to play in the Scottish referendum. I was wondering if you could offer some comments on what you think the role of historians should be in the European referendum. And is there a role for European historians? On the continent, so to make sort of historical commentary, and is it just one that historians of the last of the last sort of fifty years can comment on, or say if you are involved in you know writing pieces on Britain's involvement in, in Calais, can in, in the in early modern period you could comment on you know, the EU referendum? Because there's a sort of sense in which historians commenting on contemporary affairs is is, is okay if it's done by contemporary historians. And I just wonder if you're an early modernist or a medievalist, you know, is it harder? Are there different rules? Or oh, I think it's instinctively much more interesting. I mean, no one wants to hear about you know, the 1975 referendum particularly. To hear about Calais in, you know, uh, in sort of you know, early Tudor times or something is, is, is much more interesting. I think what doesn't work are those sort of terrible letters that we as fellows of British Academy uh, <laughs> tell you, the people of state of Trent, that being in Europe is good for you. you know, you'll succeed. Um, and what, what, worked about the, um, what worked about the Scottish stuff was that the, it, it was a sense of the sort of the history and identity of the nation. And then it was explored and explained in, you know, really, and, and, the, and the media there was so interested in it, so they were consuming print, everyone was consuming print and interested um, in it. And then you had some good pugnacious characters who went out there and, and made the case for it. But you should, you know, certainly um, make the, you know, ha have your voice in it and make the case for it. And, and that's exactly the way to do it, which is a, a sort of interesting reflection on the past, which has political relevance to the present, but is sort of unexpected, um, and, and makes us think about this debate in a different way. Because we, we're going to be, we're going to be bored about, um, you know, car tariffs um, into the common market, um, but but we but but we but we won't be bored about. I think, you know, it's a new reformation. Yeah, I think I think that's I think that's you know, much more sort of interesting and, and powerful. Now, whether it whether it will move votes, I don't know. But I think it, it in the in I think I think it's good for historians to be part of it. Um, but I think it, I think it works when you have something sort of individual and provocative um, and, and and knowledgeable to say. Definitely. Yes, George. Sorry, not from Helen's question, and from this one actually. Uh, I was just wondering about the, uh, the question, say, of political. 
influence and historians, and more specifically, I have in mind discussions about short term and long term, uh, and some terms short termism and long termism in history. And uh, so far as I can remember, so the argument is that over the years, the influence of historians in policy making has actually diminished, and this is perhaps part of the long progression of the history of specialization and people being engaged in some short term projects. So just wondering what 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 was your view on that? I th I think it's about I honestly think it's about institutional memory, um, and they say politicians are very short term because we're on the electoral you know cycle. You know, sitting here five years seems quite a long time to be honest. Um, but, the, um, um, but the but but the civil service, which is the policy making organisation, the level of churn and movement, the lack of institutional knowledge and memory in our major um, organ, and it's not just you know if you think of the Bank of England or if you think of um, major departments of state or um, you know I imagine as it were you know even the management of you know your university departments um, the the. The, the level of churn and change is such that, as it were, that institutional understanding is, uh, is, is not there. there. There are these sort of, you know, there are these moments of, um, and there's a, sort of, there's a nice piece of work to be done on you know, George Osborne and, and history, um, because, you know, he, he is a historian and he, you know, he enjoys nothing more than the Shakespeare history plays with all that that entails. <laughs> Um, but the um, and he's given lots of good money to sort of historical projects. But you know, what is he most excited by? He's most excited by um, you know biographies with Lyndon Johnson and, uh, and, and you know Robert Carrick. Um, so it's I think I think my answer is that historians are not particularly involved in it. You, you see some of these mistakes. But I think a lot of it is about the institutional memory. And remember, the best politicians, I would suggest, are, as it were, in, in terms of what in terms of sort of matrix of success for a politician, um, are two-dimensional individuals. Um, and whether it's sort of, you know, Margaret Thatcher or um, Michael Hesseltine <coughs> or whatever, they, they don't want to see every angle. Actually, you don't want to know why this didn't work in the 1950s. What you want to do is make it work and sell it and, 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 and get it through. Um, so telling Margaret Thatcher the poll tax didn't work in 1381 was not, you know, <laughs> 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 it was so good for her. She wanted, you know, uh, delivery. Um, in terms of sort of influencing public debate, um, do you always do you think that the label of historian is always useful, or um, do you think there's room for describing history in other ways? So, for example, I'm an expert on such and such, and I have a very long-term view on this issue. Um, I mean, do you think that sometimes some of the baggage surrounding history actually gets in the way of people engaging with the history itself? No, I think people like history, I think people like historians, I think that they, they think they offer something different and new and I think the sort of you know the notion of you know fuddy daddy history and all the rest of it is you know not strong. I think But is, is it not true that civil servants think very much in terms of evidence um, rather than um, academic disciplines? So they'll think what is the evidence, what is the useful evidence, what is this robust, is it authoritative, is it helpful, is it useful for me? Is that Yes, and, and they will, I mean, in, in, in those terms, you're absolutely right, in, in terms of sort of public policy debate, it's about, you know, why this worked in the state of Massachusetts to reduce recidivism, yeah. rather than um, the, the, uh, the different sort of, uh, they would rather look to an international comparison and sort of evidence on that, uh, than, as a, that, that, than a historical piece uh, of work. Um, and um, I, ideally, what, you know, ideally, what you would have were civil servants and advisors who themselves would be able to look to international data, but also point to when you know this was tried in the past and didn't work, and what and what we learned from that, and you know, and, uh, 
uh, and, how, and, how it, and how it could work. Um, I mean, you know, for, there, there's, a, there's a brilliant man called Gavin Kelly who runs the Resolution Foundation. And I, I just use that example of the, the savings issue because he did this brilliant blog um, about you know, how, how, how this policy had worked last time, uh, what, what, you know, what they learned from it, uh, how they then sort of rolled it out, and then how the, talk, how the coalition came in in 2010 and just sort of abandoned it. You know, and then brought it back. You know, six years later. <laughs> um, so the, the you're right, um, but remember the mindset of the politician is new. You know, for George Osmond to stand up and say, "Great news, we're reviving a Labour policy from 2001," um, isn't going to fly. It's a totally new thing. No one's thought of it before. It's you know, uh, and today I can announce, um, and and that's the kind of sort of um, mindset and. And just remember the sort of, I think the speed of politics now, not, not in a sort of impressive way, but just the urgency uh, of, you know, for and against, back and forth, what do you think? So, you know, job, you know today is budget day, John McDonnell was on television, you know, an hour after Jeremy sat down, saying, you know, ha being put on the spot about a series of measures in the budget. Where would Labour fall on this one, that way, and we do this and that? Um, and you know, that's a crazy way to policy making. Um, um, but, but, but the nature of it is that the response is now needed. More questions? Yes. So, Jeremy, you're the Labour Party chair. Yeah. Um, you're talking about the Labour Party chair. Yeah. You're talking about the Labour Party chair. Government and policymakers aren't necessarily interested in, oh, that didn't work then. Are you potentially saying that actually maybe a shadow cabinet, a shadow party would be interested, almost as a beat, as a, as a stick with which to therefore beat the government? And if you can't then go on television and very quickly turn around policies against the budget that was delivered an hour earlier, can historians actually have a role to play in engaging with the opposition? if potentially what they have to say is not going to influence the government because the government doesn't want to hear it? I think, yeah, I mean, I think the... I mean, my, my experience would be that the, the best way to influence debate and influence policy is not, as it were, to advise, you know, the local government minister or the shadow local government minister. It's to write a bloody brilliant book about local government or mayors or cities or whatever, which sort of sets the intellectual terrain. Um, and politicians, you know, well, we love looking clever, so, you know, pointing to, you know, new thinking and new ideas, it's all that. And then if it sort of catches a moment, you know, you, you, know, you, you want to bring them in. But in terms of the sort of the narrowness of political debate and the nature of political debate, I think historians do better to speak to be slightly sort of back from it um, and and to to make a you know your skill surely is to make a slightly more macro argument about various themes and trends. So on the one hand we've got again today a rather narrow point about removing small businesses from business rates, okay, tick. On the other hand, the government is saying local government in the future will be entirely dependent upon business rates. Well, if there are no business rates, how can they? And, and in that context, what you, know, what you could easily point to, as it were, you know, what is a big story of the coalition and Tory governments? Well, it's a complete transformation in the meaning and function of local government. And, 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 and at that level, that's rather interesting. Um, and you're, you're kind of shaping you're kind of shaping the debate. So I would, my view and advice as such is that you have more influence, as it were, making the argument on, on your own terms at some, at a, at a slight degree of distance than you do in, in, in the sort of particularities of it. But then how do you make sure that politicians read your bloody brilliant book or notice your bloody brilliant book? Because what you do, frankly, is, is you then, uh, send them a note which says, I was, I was, I mean, I was overwhelmed by your extraordinary speech in <laughs> <laughs> uh, the significance of tolling on most ways. Um, and I thought you might be interested in 
this. Um, and you've got to, and you've got to, you've got to see. Um, um, and 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 then, you know, that that begins the kind of the conversation. But there, are, you know, and, and and you know, you might be interested in my article on this, or you might be interested in you know the blog on that. And then, uh, and then if they've got a half decent office. Um, They'll look at that and find it, think it's interesting, and think, great, well, we can, you know, yeah. In an ideal world, and we're, what then happens in an ideal world is 18 months before a general election, you're you're beginning to sort of properly shape policy for the for the future. You know, in the period up to that, you're providing interesting critiques and analyses of the contemporary political situation. Um, yes. I think one of the things historians often do is talk about what doesn't work in the or what hasn't worked in the past, yeah. and yeah. much more reluctant to think about what might work in the future because that involves an interdisciplinary leap, that involves moving into social policy and, and politics, and that can become, become an issue I think for for the for the discipline. So I just really make that as a comment, thinking about what might work, what not not just what hasn't worked in the past, but what might work in the future. I think that's totally right. To, 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 I mean. Because it's always, it's always the honest, you don't want to try that, that never. Yeah. That, that yeah. Quite. yeah. No, <laughs> I mean, and think tanks provide answers. I mean, think tanks provide policy mm. answers. I mean, I've, I've been looking at Harold Wilson a lot recently because this is centennial and the rest of it. And his, his, his white heat of scientific revolution speech uh, back in 63 was totally, I mean, you could read it today about automation and changing the economy and all um, and I sort of, and I did quite a lot of scanning. I looked, I looked in vain for a sort of piece by a historian, by a contemporary historian like yourselves, maybe I've just missed it, on, as it were, the sort of, you know, what he said then mm. and did, and what we do now with, you know, Uber and gig economy and supercomputers and all the rest of it, and, and you know, what we should learn from them, what we should think about now. Um, and, um, and, 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 and that's both the sort of, it's not the narrowness of the policy, it's a particular cultural and political moment which speaks to it um, as well. So I think, you know, it's this old thing, you know, you know, politicians like solutions and they like, you know, what, yeah. what, 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 yeah. what could work and what might work. Paul. Um, I wanted to get on to the um, subject of car tariffs. Yes. That sounds a bit like the House of Commons, but... <laughs> You were, you were mentioning that that is not necessarily the way to sell a pro-European uh, uh, politics. Um, and I think we're on the same side on this, uh, being pro-EU. But one of the problems with, say, for example, European history, and if you've read Peter Wilson's new book on Habsburg Empire, and certainly his book before that, is that a lot of European history has been catastrophic. I mean, it's well documented. And there's certainly a case to say, you know, is there something wrong with the kind of society, the post-war European society, and indeed our own society, that's more concerned with car tariffs, where decisions are made over that, than the kind of things that used to be made there? And it comes back to this idea of, you seem to be suggesting that history can be used, I mean, you're not alone in this, I think you share this with, with Michael Goh, John Cruddles, people like that. You cite the American example, that it can be made into some kind of civic religion. But these identities, there, these contested identities, always seem slightly dangerous to me. And we shouldn't sell history as this means of cultivating an identity. It's simply interesting. It is a remarkable thing. It's a good discipline. It's worth it in itself. And I think we play a dangerous game, as we can see in Central Europe, as we did in uh, Scotland. And I, I don't disagree about the, the pleasantness of Tom Devine. I think he played a very slippery game there. Uh, and came out to be rather badly and, will, um, and his reputation suffered. And I'm not sure that this is necessarily the way to forge a peaceful kind of country, peaceful way to, come, to use history as that, but just to recognise that history is interesting and keep it out of the hands of politicians, I would say. Concentrate on the car tax. Um, well, I, I, would, I never used, I wouldn't use the phrase civic religion. I, I, talk, I, I spoke of history's civic function. Um, and. Um, and I think I, th I and I think I point to I think this is the difference between and maybe I've maybe I've sort of gone to the dark side uh, <laughs> that, that 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 the step over from being the sort of pure scholar to, to, to the politician I think I think it, it I, uh, I think with respect um, it would be it it would be naive to suggest 
uh, that it would never be utilized and mobilized in, 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 in the course of debate and, um, um, and politics. And so on, on the one hand, you're, you're, you're right, because uh, a sort of very functionalist argument about Europe um, is um, about car tariffs and all the rest of it, and sort of project fear, as it were, um, is, is one option. But it's but everything we hear from those who want to leave is this sort of you know island story of Britain in the world, you know, unshackled, unchained, you know. What, whereas, as I, as I sort of you know, the history of the history of these islands, and whether it's medieval history or you know early modern history or whatever, actually points to a much more rich and interesting and complicated story of our place within Europe. And so you can then have an argument about, of course, well, you know, we can still have that, that doesn't necessarily mean the EU and all, and all the rest of it. But I, I think the broader point is that the, the dehistoricization of the public realm and the lack of historical understanding in so many young people means that actually you probably need to grab history by the scruff of the neck slightly more. Uh, and if, if, if it means you need a slightly more determined teaching of British history, which is sort of less uh, uh, sort of um, pure in the sense of you should teach British history with equal importance as the history of Nigeria or India or whatever. I'll be against that. I, I would foreground an understanding of the teaching of British history um, and. Um, and yes, you know, you can't teach the history of Britain without an internationalist understanding in the context, but if you don't have that, so many of these young people who are going to give up history at 14 um, aren't, aren't going to, um, I think our schooling system fails them if, if, if they don't leave with, with some sense of money. Time for just one more question. Yes. Yeah. Um, I, I, was, I was wondering whether one of the stumbling blocks here might be that um, when policymakers go and refer to history, that they're not they're not necessarily looking for answers they want to find, but they are perhaps looking for something which reflects their outlook, perhaps on on something. I was just wondering if you had any examples or anecdotes of where someone has come across a piece of history and has genuinely had their mind changed about something because of it. Uh, in, in terms of politicians, yes, yeah, or policymakers, or it's um, a very good question. Mm -hmm. I don't. I don't know the answer to it. Uh, I'm trying to. I'm trying to think. There is a sense in which history is a rhetorical device or a resource mm -hmm. that yes. politicians can use, yeah. which I think is sort of connected to your question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. To what extent it's actually an explanatory or an analytical um, tool for them, as opposed to a presentational um, rhetorical resource that they can use to construct a particular narrative around a policy or an issue. That they've already made up their minds on. Oh, absolutely. No, I mean, you're 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 right. You, you you've got a sort of policy, and you want to bolster its legitimacy. And you know, you you, you look you look to history uh, to do so. But I mean, I wouldn't be so sort of um, pure about our profession. I mean, it is not unknown for uh, yeah. scholars to stress yeah. some things more than others, yes. and yeah. emphasise you know one no. piece of evidence above another. Um, um, so, but you know, remember, politicians have a day job, yeah. and the the, the 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 they will be they will be using history, all right, in a, in a more sort of you know rhetorical supportive function. But a good policy advisor with good institutional knowledge and and a rich understanding of uh, of um, of history is is invaluable. I think I think I think the area you know, uh, I think. I think the case to be made of, as it were, as much a historical understanding as an internationalist understanding, as it were, you know, what, what were elements of this policy or idea that worked in the past rather than just did it work in Singapore recently, um, is, is, is a sort of interesting area to stress. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tristan, for an absolutely fascinating uh, talk which generated a fascinating uh, discussion. We do have some sandwiches, tea, cake and wine for you now. So um, I will just ask you to thank our speaker once again and then we'll head to the back of the room.